Hello, and welcome to Partially Redacted, a podcast where we discuss privacy and security engineering and related topics. I'm your host, Sean Faulkner, and today I'm joined by Dr. Yoon Liu, professor at the University of Victoria, and we'll be talking about differential privacy. Yoon, welcome to the show. Uh, thanks, Sean. Awesome. So I'm really excited to have you here. You are a professor at the University of Victoria, which is the school I actually got my PhD at many, many moons ago, and you're doing research in differential privacy, and I'm sure some probably other areas as well. In many ways, you are living the professional life that I thought I was going to have at one point. So I'm looking forward to learning from you and kind of getting a glimpse into what could have been if I made different life decisions along the way. Uh, anyways, to kick things off, uh, let's start with an introduction. Who are you? What's your educational background? How did you end up where you are today? All uh, right. Um, hi. Um, so as Sean uh, very nicely uh, introduced me, uh, I'm Yun Lu. I'm, I actually grew up in Canada, uh, so where um, in BC, uh, where the University of Victoria is. Um, but I actually did my undergrad um, at UCLA, so I left Canada. And then I left the US to go to uh, do a PhD at the University of Edinburgh. Um, in Scotland, uh, and then I, uh, well, the pandemic hit, and I decided to come back to Canada. So I was kind of doing a job search, and eventually I saw a opening at UVic, and I applied, and then yeah, now I'm at UVic. So how did you, you know, find your way into? Uh, doing research and privacy during your PhD? Like what sparked that interest? Um, so that's actually kind of, uh, I stumbled upon uh, privacy a little bit. Um, my supervisor at the time, his uh, main research interest was actually multi-party computation, uh, which is cryptography. So it's the same general area, but actually quite different from differential privacy. But one day he was like, you know, there's this thing called differential privacy. It's kind of interesting. Um, maybe go take a look what it is. And I took a look and I actually just ended up doing a project on differential privacy. And yeah, so that's how I got started on differential privacy. It wasn't something my uh, supervisor did. And then afterwards, um, I kept working on privacy, it was very interesting because it is so different from the rest of cryptography. Um, so, you know, in cryptography, you're often thinking you have a function that you want to com compute or implement in a secure manner. But for privacy, a lot of times, what you're thinking about is, is my function actually leaking information about my data? Like, is the function itself bad? And yeah, that's not something that, you know, a lot of cryptographers, uh, cryptographers actually uh, have thought about. So I thought it was a very interesting topic. So I kept doing it, but yeah, but actually I, I was also at the time doing a lot of uh, blockchain related stuff, which is quite, quite different from uh, differential privacy. So I have kind of this two different streams of uh, work, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like you know you kind of started maybe with initial interest in cryptography, and then you kind of almost like fell into this world of differential privacy, which I think is a good sort of segue. You know, one of the common questions that I like to ask guests that we have on the show is, you know, what future privacy tools and technologies are they excited about? And probably over half the guests that I've interviewed mentioned differential privacy as in their response. So you know, it's awesome to have someone here that actually has expertise and we can kind of deep dive into it. But for those that are, you know, listening that maybe don't know a lot about what differential privacy is, maybe this is the first time they're even hearing about it. What, what is differential privacy? Um, so actually, you say this is a kind of like, you know, a simple question, but a lot of people have been trying to state a more kind of semantic meaning of differential privacy. So you have the you know, formal mathematical meaning of differential privacy, but you know, it's actually one of the difficulties is to describe it to just you know, normal data users, like how your data is gonna be uh, protected 
with differential privacy. But I would say that um, to describe differential privacy in an informal way, um, maybe start with, uh, so maybe we can start with a kind of an intuitive understanding of privacy. So one of the um, earlier definitions of privacy is, so in 1977, uh, Delanius actually tried to kind of state what privacy is. So the idea of privacy is that you shouldn't be able to learn some private information about any individual from a data release mechanism, right? So you shouldn't be able to learn like new data. Um, if you see like a piece of research, right? You shouldn't be able to um, say something more about the individual uh, that participated in this research than if you didn't see that piece of research. Um, but actually, there there is some flaws with that definition, and there is a kind of a cute example of that. Um, so, think about uh, let's say you have a a alien from from Mars, right? So this alien <laughs> uh, comes to Earth and wants to study humans. Okay, so this alien doesn't know about much about humans, so maybe they think that humans have one leg, right? So after some study, right, of some research, maybe the alien kidnaps some humans, uh, the alien finds out that humans have two legs in general. Okay, so technically the alien learns something about individuals, right? So like, let's say you take Bob, right? You know, Bob is a typical human, so maybe the alien learned something about Bob, right? So Bob probably has two legs. But is that really breaking Bob's privacy is the question. So the alien learns something new, but it's not really le uh, leaking people's privacy. So then differential privacy comes along and it actually more well defines uh, what we want from privacy, which is even without using Bob's data, we should be able to learn the same thing. Right? We should be able to learn without Bob that humans generally have two legs or that, you know, cancer can be caused by smoking or that, you know, there's like certain elements in a human genome. Right? So um, differential privacy basically says that the output of a data release mechanism should be pretty similar whether or not uh, one person like Bob or Alice or whoever is in that data set or not. So that's uh, sort of kind of a long-winded way to describe what uh, differential privacy is. Yeah, so it sounds like the idea is that whatever sort of inference that we're getting from the resulting data, we should be able to do that without you know, a core requirement of a single individual being part of that data set. Mm -hmm. So where did this idea come from? What's sort of the history of differential privacy? Uh, so I can't say exactly whether, you know, what is the initial sort of spark necessarily. But uh, so I've been watching uh, the talks by uh, Cynthia Dork, which is one of the, uh, you know, initial uh, inventors of differential privacy. And uh, according to those talks, it seems like differential privacy is, uh, came about from uh, uh, the US census. So the census from United States. Um, so census is like a survey, right? So of different people uh, in, that live in the United States. And they do that, I think every 10 years. Um, and it actually is really important. It determines like, uh, legislative, like boundaries and seats in different like regions. So it's actually a very important uh, process. But of course, because it takes uh, people's private in, uh, data, um, you have to pr protect people's data, right? So it it takes things like people's uh, salary. Sometimes uh, it takes people's uh, sex, race, so on. So um, I think differential privacy, well, according to those talks, 
uh, actually came about from a desire to protect those people's data. I see. And then how does differential privacy actually prevent an attacker, attacker from you know, reconstructing the data from a published result versus maybe something like you know, an anonymization technique? Yeah, so uh, that's a good question. Um, and that's why that differential privacy is one of the sort of gold standards nowadays. Uh, you would say that actually, um, I think it's not a, a incorrect statement to make to say that differential privacy is probably the only uh, privacy definition we have uh, nowadays, maybe up to like some variants and so on. Um, and the reason is because, well, taking uh, the US census as an uh, example, um, actually until 2020, so just two years ago, when they did the 2020 census, um, they actually did some, you know, anonymization techniques, and they did this kind of secretive thing where they they swap different rows, and um, they actually found that even if they do this kind of secretive technique to anonymize, it wasn't enough to uh, prevent uh, reconstruction attacks, and so actually these sort of ad hoc anonymization attacks, uh, sorry, anonymization techniques didn't help. And things like K-anonymity, which is actually still being used today, um, does help a little bit, but it actually has some issues with uh, these things called like external data or auxiliary data. So, you know, even if you apply this technique, if you have uh, external data or auxiliary data, um, sometimes it still leaks privacy. Um, so, you know, actually differential privacy is one that, uh, you know, prevents all these previous uh, attacks. So that's why it's actually being used so much nowadays. Yeah, I think uh, the other classic example with using sort of external data was uh, uh, the with Netflix, where they released a bunch of what they thought was anonymized data, and they made a contest around yeah. uh, I forget the exact nature of the contest, but essentially people were able to combine the Netflix data with IMDb ratings to actually reconstruct and identify a bunch of people. So in these examples, what is it that differential privacy is actually doing to make it so that you can't identify an individual? Um, so the, yeah, the Netflix example you said, um, basically uh, a little bit more context to that is that they release all this data because they wanted people to uh, come up with recommender systems. So these recommender systems would take an individual's kind of like watch history and say, okay, given that this person likes, I don't know, uh, The Crown and um, John Wick, they might like, uh, I don't know, uh, they might like this third movie, uh, which is kind of similar to these two uh, original movies they watched, right? So, um, but then the issue is that they only anonymized people's uh, names. So they just gave them like identifiers. And as you know, people's watch histories um, are pretty unique. And they're actually pretty sparse, right? It's not. It's very unlikely you watched a, a lot of movies, or like you know, even a very small percentage of the Netflix like movie database. Um, and people who like to rate movies generally like to rate them on IMDb and also on Netflix, right? So what people were able to do is to uh, kind of take the watch histories of uh, the Netflix data set and kind of match them to the IMDb's uh, rating uh, data set, which is open. And they were able to actually de-anonymize a bunch of people. Um, and, and yeah, so it actually, they, it actually resulted in uh, this uh, class lawsuit um, against Netflix. And that's actually uh, made them cancel their, they were going to do another one of these uh, contests and uh, actually got canceled because of the lawsuit. Um, so back to the question where why did, why does differential privacy help 
against this, right? So, well, first of all, actually, differential privacy under differential privacy, you wouldn't even it wouldn't be allowed to output this data set, right? So, I mean, if the data set is already out there, there's nothing you can do, right? Because it's already out there. You can use it to attack people's privacy. But under differential privacy, this shouldn't have been allowed. So, but under just ad hoc anonymization, um, this Netflix data set is allowed to be outputted. So that's why, uh, in a sense, differential privacy does prevent a lot of these like kind of careless type of mistakes of privacy kind of leakage uh, from happening. So when you say it wouldn't have been allowed, is that because essentially the computation of like a function over the data set to determine is this actually differentially private would return yeah. essentially the result of faults. So then they would know, okay, well, we can't release this. Yeah, so under differential privacy, um, if you want all your data release uh, to satisfy differential privacy, you have to prove that it does, right? And you cannot prove that the Netflix data set release is differentially private. And, and the idea is, right, like what you can see is that if one person is, in, in, is not in the data set, it's actually quite clear whether it is or isn't because you just look at the data set and then see whether that watch history is there or not, right? Let's say you have a person who, the only person who ever watched, I don't know, some very obscure film, right? Um, then maybe they're the only person in that data set who watched that film. And you can see what really clearly whether that guy is in there or not. So what is the like common approaches or techniques to making something differentially private? Is it always a matter of adding some sort of noise to the data set to sort of obscure the, or, or make it, you know, so that you can actually determine whether a piece of data is fake or whether it's real? Um, yeah, so, so to achieve differential privacy, you actually do need to have some sort of randomness. Um, and because the way that differential privacy is described or defined is that the output distribution, so distribution, if you think, is already kind of something to do with probabilities, right? So the output distribution is very similar regardless whether one person is in the database or not, right? So the output that you get from the data release process should be pretty similar regardless you have like any individual in there or, or not that individual. So um, by definition, uh, some sort of randomness is required. Um, but the way that you actually achieve that randomness is, is quite different uh, depending on what you want. So there are some pretty fundamental um, so-called mechanisms. So mechanisms, basically, you start with a deterministic function you want to achieve. So for example, you want to compute the average salary of people in a database, or you want to compute the oldest person's age in that database or something like that. So you have a deterministic function, but you want to make that differentially private, so you add noise. Um, what kind of noise you add uh, depends basically on what kind of uh, privacy uh, parameters you want. And for example, there is Laplace mechanism where you add Laplace noise, or uh, there is Gaussian mechanism where you add Gaussian noise. Um, but actually, there's uh, other things like uh, exponential mechanism, which allows you to actually uh, have kind of outputs that are not real numbers. And you can actually determine uh, what kind of output distribution you want. Um, and then there's uh, things like sparse vector technique, which is for a stream of data. Yeah, so there's actually a lot of different uh, mechanisms. Right, and is the, are you typically adding noise in a way where it's somehow like correlated with the original data sets distribution so that uh, essentially you can still reliably compute results from the, 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 the resulting data? Yeah, so the output has to be, well, 
you know, if your uh, privacy re uh, data release mechanism somehow doesn't depend on the data, then you have a pretty kind of useless mechanism, right? It, it's going to be the same regardless of what data you have. So it has to re rely on the data. But the idea usually, um, especially for things like Laplace or Gaussian mechanism, uh, the idea is that you add noise that is independent of the data. Um, so you have the output of your you know, analysis on this data, but you add noise that is independent of the data. Yeah, so it depends on what mechanism you have, basically. So maybe going back to one of the examples or use cases you talked about earlier, like either the census or maybe the Netflix example, or, or if, or you could choose a different one, but can you kind of walk through an example use case of how you would actually add noise to a data set to make it differentially private? Let's give a kind of concrete example, right? Let's say something with census. So let's say in the census, right, you want to compute um, the average age of people in a in a specific region, right? That's after often how you tell you know whether this region in the United States has like more young people or more old people, right? Um, so when you compute the uh, average age, it's a deterministic number, right? You're not gonna have some kind of random age, right? That doesn't make sense. So let's say the average age of people in this uh, like region is, um, I don't know, 30, 30 years old. So you have 30 years old, but if you output the number 30, uh, it actually violates differential privacy because uh, you're not, you haven't added any randomness to it, right? And actually, you can actually see how it, uh, violates differential privacy, you know. So it's a, so to actually have a differential privacy, you have to add some kind of noise to that number 30. So you can say, let's say that we use a Laplace mechanism. Um, the Laplace mechanism, uh, you can actually customize it with some level of noise and with different levels of noise, it, uh, achieves different levels of privacy. So there is a uh, privacy parameter, um, it's called epsilon. Um, and very informally, it uh, describes the general level of privacy that is achieved by this data release mechanism. So if uh, epsilon is big, um, actually it, it determines uh, uh, the amount of noise you give. So Bigger epsilon is actually worse privacy, so it's a bit uh, <laughs> opposite for differential privacy. You think, oh, you want bigger parameters, the better. But actually, in differential privacy, uh, smaller parameters is better. So, so basically, um, for Laplace mechanism, you actually uh, output something that is proportional to Laplace noise, but uh, parameterized by something uh, like one over epsilon. Uh, so like proportional to something like uh, one over epsilon. And basically that's how you uh, output something in a differentially private manner. You start with a deterministic output and then you add some kind of noise that's determined by the uh, privacy parameter. Hey there, it's Sean, host of Partially Redacted. You probably guessed that since at this point in the interview, you probably recognize my voice. I've been told for years that I have a face for podcasting, but no one has mentioned whether I have a voice for podcasting, so sorry about that. Hopefully, the awesome guest makes up for it. Anyway, if you're enjoying this episode, please support the show by subscribing and telling your friends. You can also join the Partially Redacted community at skyflow.com slash community. Okay, that's enough for me. Back to the show. So in the example that you were giving where you're computing like average age, is that on each individual record that you're using to compute the average age, are you adding a little bit of noise to that? Or are you sort of randomly you know, flipping a coin and deciding whether you add noise or not? Oh, okay, so yeah. So what you're saying with um, adding noise to each uh, data point uh, is something called local differential privacy. And that is something slightly newer. 
Um, so in the kind of standard setting is what we call central differential privacy. Uh, is you actually compute the data uh, and then you add noise or basically you have all the data in the like real all the real data no noise just the real data set and then you compute something from it um maybe what you're saying is uh, local differential privacy where the idea here is that you don't like as a user end user right you don't even trust the central like data curator to protect your data right so what you do is you add your you yourself as an end user add some amount of noise to your to your data before sending it to the central curator um, because you don't necessarily trust you know <laughs> Apple or whoever uh, <laughs> to keep your data safe right um, so or you don't want to have like, you know, Google learn all the things about you, right? So you might want to uh, add a bit of noise to your own data before you send it over. And that, of course, actually is is slightly stronger, right? Because you add noise even before uh, doing any computation. So yeah, so there's two kind of ways to add noise. What are some of the practical applications of differential privacy so far? Is this, you know, all theoretical or are people actually using this in the real world? Yeah, so um, other than the uh, uh, U.S. Census example, uh, which is, so in 2020, the census actually used differential privacy uh, to, you know, protect people's data. Other than that, um, things, uh, big companies like Apple, Google, Uber, they're all using differential privacy. And actually, um, differential privacy in machine learning is a pretty big topic nowadays. Um, and there actually are many tools uh, that are available. Uh, so if you're even if you're not like a big you know, privacy expert or you're not great at programming necessarily, you can actually use these tools um, to uh, make your application more private. In our, for the census example, were they using the central di differential privacy method? Yes. Um, then, well, yeah, because, right, like, uh, well, by legally, uh, you're, you're not allowed to, you know, s lie <laughs> on your <laughs> on your uh, census results, right? Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. And then I guess in, in a machine learning model, is it, are they more relying on the local method where they're essentially adding some noise before doing the training? Yeah. Um, and actually, so there is this thing called... Um, like federated learning, federated learning. And um, so the idea is that you start with um, like your phone, right? Your phone knows a lot about you, right? It, it has a lot of data, like, you know, your keystrokes, apps you uh, visit and so on. Um, but to send all that data, well, to, to like, a, your, like Google or Apple, um, it's it, first of all, it's a lot of data, and second of all, um, of course, this is really bad for your privacy. So, um, your phone actually trains like locally uh, on your data, um, and then sends the model itself to like the central server, right? And in that sense, actually, you can actually apply differential privacy to. Uh, help also secure that model, right? So the model itself leaks something about you, but you can actually apply differential privacy to that model and then send it to uh, send it to the central server. And actually it helps uh, improve uh, robustness, for example. Yeah, and uh, I think federated learning is a fascinating topic, which hopefully at some point we'll do, do a show on as well. What are some of the like, challenges of actually implementing differential privacy? So, well, the first one actually um, is to actually determine what privacy parameter to use. Um, as you know, um, privacy is about adding randomness, right? Um, but 
as you also know, adding more randomness causes more uh, ac uh, accuracy loss. And so um, there is this inherent kind of push and pull between privacy and accuracy. Uh, although, you know, sometimes adding randomness could uh, help with other aspects, but, you know, generally more randomness means less accurate results, right? Um, so there is this kind of um, uncertainty in kind of people who are implementing differentially private mechanisms and what parameter to choose because they, first of all, want private, you know, algorithms algorithms, but they also want, you know, private, private algorithms, and they also want utility in their algorithms. Um, and then there's the other thing, which is just um, a bit more of a political pushback. Um, like when uh, the census was, uh, you know, it was announced that there was going to be um, differential privacy, which you know, protects your data and that's great. But actually there was a lot of pushback because um, the results of the data, because it's so randomized, people say, okay, maybe that would be actually really bad because the result of the census determines a lot about future policies and future laws, right? It determines like how many seats does like a, a region get, right? So why, how can you, how can you randomize that, right? And if you think, you know, uh, I don't know if you heard about, um, like in 2016, um, Iowa had this like delegation, like uh, uh, election where they couldn't decide who to win, uh, who wins. So they actually did a coin flipping and people kind of freaked out uh, because like, how can you decide the result of an election from coin flipping, right? So, you know, like all this kind of things, like, so randomness is inherently kind of like a iffy thing for people, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And I imagine, you know, from trying to, ex like, it's, it's difficult to explain differential privacy to, I think, like a, you know, a technical person mm -hmm. that, you know, works in the space, maybe has some math training, let alone to, you know, just you know the, a regular person and you start to talk about randomness and they think about you know gambling or something like that which makes it kind of hard For to sure. wrap their head around yeah yeah actually um i i really think they probably need a uh, I, I so i'm teaching a, a course on data privacy and i i, I do feel like something like a, you know <laughs> one semester course is kind of required to get all the you know the actual like just um mm -hmm of the whole thing, but yeah. Yeah, you, uh, differential privacy needs like a PR firm or something. Yeah, it does. Uh, well, I mean, there. Um, I, I think I think Th Cynthia Dork uh, is a great kind of promoter of differential privacy. Um, she did a lot of talks um, and it, they're all available on YouTube and they're really good. Um, and I think they're accessible I, uh, first and foremost to just people who care about privacy, but don't necessarily have like a very, you know, in-depth um, math background. So I, I would, I mean, you know, for people who are interested in privacy, but don't want to read like a textbook um, to watch those videos by Cynthia Dork. Oh, that's They're great. great. Yeah, we'll uh, make a point to add those into the show notes. So I wanted to talk a little bit about your area of research. So what area of, you know, differential privacy and maybe even beyond that is your research focused on? Um, so my first work um, on differential privacy is to do with uh, the privacy of social choice mechanisms. So, I mean, in more like human terms, <laughs> social choice mechanisms are things like uh, voting. So. Um, or rank aggregation. So basically things like um, if you have a bunch of people and each person has a preference or like a ranking of different candidates, it can be like actual, you know, election candidates or it can be products on Amazon, right? You can give like a score to each product, right? Um, and given all these people's preferences, 
you have to choose like one uh, winner. So in an actual election, it's like the winning candidate, right? The president or the prime minister, whoever. Um, and so the issue with social choice mechanisms or their privacy is that social choice mechanisms are often deterministic. And as I uh, heard, um, you know, differential privacy requires randomization. So, you know, to reconcile the fact that a lot of voting is deterministic and the fact that <laughs> privacy does need uh, randomization, we actually uh, use this. So there are variants of differential privacy, and one of those variants is to actually uh, uh, consider a underlying uh, distribution on the data. And so we actually use some uh, distributions that are pretty common as an assumption in social choice theory. And uh, we analyze the social choice mechanisms or the voting mechanisms um, under those assumptions in uh, dis distributed dis uh, <laughs> distributed differential privacy. They're very, they're a mouthful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of uh, a lot of D's in there. Yes. The, so you've done, you know, as you mentioned, like work on sort of voting data privacy. Like, historically, how have like politicians, I guess, exploited the data available on voters? Um, so you might have heard uh, about like Cambridge Analytica, right? That's like the biggest scandal, I guess, um, from recent years regarding leakage of voting data. Um, so the story is that um, Cambridge Analytica is this data analysis firm, and um, it actually took uh, like the Facebook profiles of I think millions of people, and they sold them as voter profiles. And but actually, it's it's kind of not just that, right? It's a part of a bigger problem. Um, actually. I don't I think not just American politics, but I think politics around the world, um, candidates rely on these voter profiles and big data to win, basically, right? So they they need this data to know, you know, where do they campaign, where like what kinds of things do people care about, right? Like what kind of talking points should they should they use? And this all this data, where is it coming from? It's a lot of it's coming from like things like um, social media or just anything that's public, right? Even things that are not necessarily public, they might have access to them, and they generate these things called voter profiles, which allow them to, you know, categorize people into blocks, and you know, be able to appeal to each of these blocks. And yeah, that definitely is really bad for privacy, but uh, you know, it, it works well for them. Um, yeah. Yeah. And I guess, how, I mean, I, I imagine a lot of the like prevention of things like that really come down to, you know, re regulatory requirements that have to be enforced. But how do we, you know, prevent things like privacy leakage when releasing election results? How, do, how can something like differential privacy help there? So, um, surprisingly, there's actually a lot of data that's released as part of an election. Uh, if you take a look at, um, I, I, I did a study um, of more on the U.S. election, but um, I think even in you know Canadian election, it's kind of similar, where there's a lot of like tallies based on um, different uh, areas like towns and so on. And these tallies actually are very sometimes very small because a lot of times are uh, a lot of times the towns themselves have very few people, and showing you know how many people voted for you know different parties or in you know not just the prime minister or presidential election but on like smaller elections, um, this actually is really revealing especially to people who live in that town and maybe knows many of these people, um, you know, who your your neighbor voted, maybe. So uh, so I think one of those, uh, the ways that uh, differential privacy can help 
is to at least obscure some of that data in a formal and systematic way, such that it doesn't leak as much information about individuals. Right. Yeah. And as someone who grew up in a very small town in, in Canada, I can uh, relate to the idea of you don't need a lot of data to identify an individual. <laughs> um, you know, I guess like looking ahead and uh, um, to, you know, various people in, in your field of research and, and as well as from your perspective, what are some of the big challenges in privacy research today that we, you know, absolutely need to try to solve? I would say that one of the big challenges is standardization. And that kind of ties back to the, the fact that it's so difficult to decide what uh, privacy parameters to use. Because, you know, as you know, there's this push and pull between privacy and uh, utility. And on the other hand, it's also you know, very difficult to explain what, you know, a privacy parameter of three, you know, means, right? It's like the number three, okay. Um, but so so I think it's very difficult to explain to uh, just regular end users what privacy means. And it's even more difficult to standardize because I think for different applications, it, it kind of depends what they feel like the privacy should be. So if you think, you know, should the privacy level standard be the same for, you know, like your, <laughs> so like Apple sends out, I think your emoji use. <laughs> so I, I, you probably you think, okay, I, I don't really care about them knowing like what kinds of emojis I use, but maybe I care about things like my health data, which, you know, Apple also has, right? Maybe. Um, so should those two things have the same standard of privacy? Probably not. Um, right. Yeah, so that's difficult to, to standardize. And it's not the same thing as like, you know, encryption. Encryption has standards, but it's much easier to standardize things like encryption because you're not necessarily sacrificing much by having a more you know, more security than you, you need, right? So it's just maybe sacrifice a little bit of performance, but it's you're really not that bad. But for privacy, you sacrifice a lot by, you know, adding more privacy. Right, yeah. I mean, with encryption, like even though there might be performance differences, the utility value is still the same. You're going to decrypt mm -hmm. the data and then you have it yeah. available to you. Whereas in privacy, like, the end result of the data that you're producing could mm -hmm. fulfill a whole spectrum of different levels of privacy and that impacts the actual utility of the information that you're generating. Mm -hmm. So I said at the top of the show that I always like to ask people about, you know, what sort of future privacy technologies they're interested in. And, you know, a lot of people say differential privacy, but is there anything beyond <laughs> differential privacy for, you know, future privacy technologies that you are yourself excited about? I would say that differential privacy has lots of variants and those variants kind of come about because people see differential privacy, they think it's great, but they think maybe it's not super uh, applicable to their own kind of use, right? For example, in social choice, um, it's deterministic and deterministic algorithms cannot be differentially private, so they use distributional differential privacy to, I mean, we use <laughs> distributional differential privacy to uh, solve our problems. Um, and other people say, oh, I don't, I don't really like how um, differential privacy like de defines the distance between output distribution. So I'll define it as something else and I can prove the same, you know, nice properties that differential privacy has, like composition, um, post-processing, et cetera. So there's so many um, variants. And actually, that's something I, I really like. Um, but on the other hand, I'm kind of scared that, you know, there, there's this like explosion of number of variants and people, everyone's going to disagree on what people should use or shouldn't use. Um, and I just feel like it's 
And there's like a you know alphabet soup of kinds of differential privacy. Right? There's like A D P, B D P, C D P. Right. So um, like I wish maybe there's more of a maybe structure or framework um, that encompasses maybe classes of variants. Um, maybe we can prove things under the same umbrella. Um, so yeah, maybe that's something I'm more excited to see uh, possibly in the future. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's a huge area. It's, you know, I think as someone who maybe have only heard about differential privacy, I think you, it, you might sort of think of it in terms of a specific you know, technique like, I don't know, uh, you know, uh, tokenization or something like that. Whereas it's really an umbrella of a whole bunch of different, mm -hmm. uh, you know, techniques and, and approaches. And there's even, you know, variants in the style with which you uh, apply it to a data set and so on. So it's kind of a huge rich area that I'm sure there's going to be a ton of research and development well into the future. Yeah. So Ian, thanks so much for coming on. Um, you know, as I mentioned, uh, a couple times. This is, you know, a topic that keeps coming up. So I think a lot of people will be excited to listen and learn from you. And I'll make sure to include links to your work in the show notes, as well as the YouTube uh, channel that you mentioned. And thanks again and cheers. Thanks.